We forget that 30 years prior to that, the British came and occupied this land, and they are the ones that set up this Zionist state. They set the foundation for this Zionist state with Balfour Declaration and the occupation of this land. And you know what? When General Allenby, the one that came in in December 1917, he walked in with pride into the city and he said, today the Crusades have ended. This legacy, when 80, 800 years ago, Salah al-Din had liberated Beit al-Maqdis, they had not forgotten the Crusades and every single century from the time of Salah al-Din, including, including Christopher Columbus, he went west for what? to prepare a new crusade to take this land. This was written in his own memoirs by his hand, that his mission was to raise a new crusade to take Beit al-Maqdis back from the Muslims. They never forgot. And even on the day that he entered the holy city, he talked about this last crusade. But we have a greater Nakba. And Nakba, if you do not know, it means a catastrophe. It means a great catastrophe. The greater Nakba is not the occupation of the land of Beit al-Maqdis and the Masjid al-Aqsa. The greater Nakba is the occupation of the Muslim mind. And as long as your minds are not free, we will never be able to free al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Our terminologies, Middle East, the borders of Palestine have been set by them. Everything that you see within this conflict, narrowing it now down to being a nationalist issue, is part of the Nakba. The terminologies we use, instead of talking about the Barak wall, we're talking about the Wailing Wall. A wall that was never important to Jews before the Ottoman period, before the end of the Ottoman period. They never came to that wall. Now it is their holiest site. And it is the nail of Juha in order to take the rest of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and build a Zionist temple, a, a Jewish temple over it. What they've done is this Ummah, like Uqsa brings nine ulama count, uh, bodies together under one umbrella, this Ummah was all under one single umbrella. That's what made us strong. And they understood that's what makes you strong. So what they do they do? The, the colonialists who've occupied the Muslim world from Indonesia to where? To Morocco, across the whole of the Muslim world, was occupied by colonialists. And what they did is they divided us across lines, lines in the sand. You just look at the map of Africa, how it's been split up. Look at the map of what they call the Middle East, but actually it is Bilad al-Sham. And what did they do to it? They split it up. They created identities, new identities that didn't even, even exist, like Jordan. And the geography teacher at the University of Dundee, where I used to study, he used to say, he used to brag on how they managed to create new identities in this region. And with the inferiority complex that the Muslims live in towards the West, we're not able to free our minds before we are able to free Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Every day there is a new Nakba. Every day there is a new catastrophe. Every day, and it continues. But we need to move out of emotion towards knowledge. We need to move from emotion towards knowledge, and we need to be able to free our minds and end the intellectual Nakba, because the first step towards the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis is the Fath of knowledge, al-Fath al-Ma'rifi. And here, I want to appeal to your intellect that it is not just about sending money to Palestine. It's about time that we need to have a research centers that will free the minds of the Muslims. Scholarships for students to study this. This is not a Palestinian issue. And for that, we need to create research centers and we need to have educational institutions across the, world, the whole world. The field of Islamic Jerusalem studies started in the UK. 
the first center in the Muslim world was established in University of Tara, Malaysia, UUM, in 2014, and it was launched by Mahathir Muhammad. The third has been set up in Turkey with a master and PhD program, and the, and the fourth has just last month been set up in Indonesia yes, at a private university. And it's time maybe South Africa will take the lead in creating scholarship okay. on Bayt okay. al-Maqdis. We need to come together to set and to work for Bayt al-Maqdis and for the liberation of Bayt al-Maqdis. And the first start is through knowledge. This is a, a, a place that has a history that goes back tens of thousands of years. It goes back to the first human on earth, and that is Adam. Alayhi salam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us of the history of this land. But I'm going to concentrate on three points and wrap up with the current occupation. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is what we discussed for two days here with uh, many people from across Cape Town, is what do we need to do after two days? What do we need to do for Bayt al And one is Bayt al-Maqdis was the first Qibla of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a master thesis was done on the concept of what Qibla is in Islam. And why is the concept of Qibla very important and very central to Muslims. And the way today you are connected to the Kaaba, the Sahaba were connected to Al-Masjid al-Aqsa. The way that you yearn, and today people are going to the Kaaba, and you wish that you were there. The Sahaba wanted to be in Bayt al-Maqdis, and the Sahaba were connected to this land. It was their Qibla for 13 years in Mecca and a year and a half in uh, Medina. And the Sahaba would come to Rasulullah like al arqam on the day Umar bin Khattab accepts Islam. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, in you read Bayt al-Maqdis. Ya Rasulullah, I would like to go to Bayt al-Maqdis. And what would connect him if it was not for the prayer that he would pray? And he wouldn't pray five times a day. He would pray not half an hour a day, but six and seven hours every day towards Bayt al-Maqdis. Because they would pray in the morning and in the evening, and night prayer was an obligation. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, qum layla illa qalila. They would stand up and pray all night towards where? Towards Bayt al-Maqdis. Our Qibla. The Qibla of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is under occupation. How would we face Rasulullah on the day of judgment? How would we face, how would we answer to Allah on that day that we lived at a time when Al-Aqsa was occupied? Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is the second mosque on earth. Allah says in the Quran, the first mosque on earth is the Kaaba. Inna awwala baytin lin nasi. The first house, the first structure built for humanity is that the Kaaba, the house in Becca, blessed Wahudan and a guidance for the world. And this was from the time of not Ibrahim, Ibrahim raised the foundation. This was from the time of Adam. Forty years later, as Rasulullah tells us in the Sahih Hadith in Bukhari that Al-Aqsa was built from that time. It, there was no even Palestinians at that time. There was only Muslims saying La ilaha illallah. For that reason, Al-Aqsa belongs to you as much as it belongs to me. As much as it belongs to every single Muslim around the world. Al-Aqsa was also central to the minds of the Sahaba when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about it in the Quran, in the first Quranic prophecy, Alif Lam Mim Ghulibati Rum, that was a battle that took place in the Holy Land. And this is part of reviving our terminology, the Holy Land, the land of Barakah, are names given by Allah to this land. And today we take the British drone boundaries of Palestine to be our reference. We do not know what the Holy Land is and what it entails. We do not know what the land of Barakah is. They made us forget our terminologies and even the terminology of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the name Baytul Maqdis. Many Muslims do not even know what this terminology actually means. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, to connect himself to this land, even made a wager 
on this land. This land was the place that Sahaba were connected to spiritually, religiously, politically, and then it goes on. And this was all before the night journey and ascension of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah was taken to this land. If Allah had willed, he would have raised him directly from the Kaaba to, to the highest of heavens. But Allah takes Rasulullah to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa so that, so that you do not forget Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It is a verse in the Quran and it is something that all of us need to be connected to. Rasulullah says in the, Quran, in the Hadith, you should not set out to visit except three masjids. Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and my masjid. And today we can visit two, but the third has, is under occupation. Rasulullah told the Sahaba, you know what? Go and pray in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It is the land of raising and gathering. Do you know that if you do not go today, you're gonna go there one day. You know when? When you're gonna be resurrected from your grave, your first station will be Baytul Maqdis. It is the land of raising and gathering. Rasulullah, when he was asked by Maymuna, what is Baytul Maqdis? Tell us about Baytul Maqdis. Give us a fatwa about Baytul Maqdis. And Rasulullah says, it is the land of raising and gathering. Go! And pray in it, for a prayer in it is equal to a thousand elsewhere. She said, what if one cannot go? And at that time, Abu Dawood in the Sunnah says at that time it was war. And Rasulullah didn't say, just make dua. Didn't say, just learn more or follow what's happening or do this or do that. Rasulullah wanted you to take action. And Rasulullah said, send the gift. For the one that sends a gift, will get the same reward of Salah. This was the last time Al-Aqsa saw the honor of this Ummah. The Muslim armies, before they would go to battle, this is 110 years ago. 